Okay. So welcome everyone to our RSG Colombia uh, webinars. And today we will have a great talk on translational omics in microbiome studies from data to therapies by Gabriel Fernandez. Gabriel holds a PhD in bioinformatics from uh, Federal University of Minas Gerais in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. And nowadays he's a researcher in the bioinformatics and next generation sequencing platform at Instituto René Rachou, uh, Fiocruz in Minas Gerais. And thank you very much, uh, Gabriel, for being mm -hmm. with us today. And please go ahead with your great talk. Thank you, Gabriel. You're welcome. Uh, so good morning, everyone, because it's still morning there, right? <laughs> Here is afternoon already. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to give uh, an, an overview about the things that we've been doing in, in, in microbiome studies and uh, where we want to reach at some point. Uh, I've been working with microbiome studies since the, like 10 years ago. I started to work with microbiome in, in 2009. So I, I kind of... Uh, followed the, all this evolution and the changing technologies of sequence technology and the way that we, we analyze the data. So today I'm going to, uh, to talk a little bit about the background of, of microbiome studies, uh, the approach that we use to study it and the approach that we used uh, 10 years ago to, for, you, for you to understand the difference and how to interpret this, this kind of data. And uh, finally, I'm going to talk about modern. That is where we want to reach at some point to uh, bring this, uh, this biological information that we identified through this, uh, to this kind of analysis that I will show you, show you here and uh, use this information to build models for uh, diagnosis, prognosis, and even some therapeutic approaches. So, uh, so first, the, the microbiome background. So, talking about the prehistoric, actually, it's not prehistoric, but it's before the, the, the things that we know today. Uh, so, uh, in, in the, the 16th, uh, uh, the 17th century, so this, the scientist von Leverwork identified some, some bacteria in this two and, and mouse samples. So he identified bacteria that were different in this two environment. So this could be associated to the environment by itself. So this was the precursor of the microbiota. So there were some microorganisms living in the human body. And uh, in 1880s, so Iskerich, you know why the bacteria is called Iskerich, I call it. Uh, he observed some, some bacteria that was appearing in healthy and uh, uh, ill children. So this bacteria could be associated to some, some disease there. And also he identified that this bacteria can be living there as, as a symbiont, not necessarily causing some, some disease. And in 1907, uh, so this, this scientist identified the role of microbiota in health and disease. And from that moment on, we started to see uh, the microbiota as something normal, not always associated with some disease and then to be uh, used for, for some good approach as well. So then we started the genomic era. So when we start to sequence everything, so the first uh, fecal sample uh, sequence, it was in 1996. Uh, it was used through the Sanger technology, of course, at the moment, that was what we had. And uh, in 2006, we started the first gut metagenomics study, the, the, the big one. 2007, we started the human microbiome project. Uh, like maybe six months ago, they released the second version of human microbiome project. There are a lot of data they are already produced. But at that moment, we wanted to identify the, the, the microorganisms there and also to produce some reference genomes that could be used for future studies to associate the, the micro 
organelles in the human body. And uh, uh, this human microbiome project had some branch, a kind of branch, but kind of competitor as well. In Europe, that's what's called the MetaHIP, which is metagenomic uh, human intestinal tract. But it's uh, the human microbiome, but focus on gut. Okay? And uh, why we want to study this, this microbiome? We see that we have an environment here behind this bacteria that we can identify using the cell culture. So there are a lot of things that we don't see in the cell culture, but they are there. And uh, sometimes we cannot isolate it. Sometimes we cannot cultivate, but they are there and maybe they, they have a role there. So in 2009, we started the description of this, this gut environment. So uh, it was published in, in Nature, the Human Gut Gene Catalog. So uh, we sequenced 124 samples. So we produced a lot of data for that moment. It was a huge effort to sequence that in Illumina Genome Analyzer because Illumina Genome Analyzer was one of the first Illumina sequence to the throughput was not that big as, as it is today. So it was a milestone for, for, for the field, of course. We identified 3.3 .3, uh, million genes that, uh, unique genes that could be associated to some, some functions in the, in the, in the human gut. So uh, in 2010, we started to search for patterns there. Uh, so we described for the first time the enterotypes of the human gut. So for that study, we used 39 samples and also sequencing uh, with Sanger technology. So we need to sequence a lot of information and a lot of effort. And uh, this big effort just produces 120K reads per sample. So 120 uh, thousand reads per sample. Nowadays we consider it few, few reads. So, but that that was uh, the technology available for for that for that time. And we wanted to identify some patterns. So it was by country or group, and by family or by age. And then we identified that there is no association uh, by country, family, or age. Uh, at least the group, the, the, the individuals are not clustered based on that parameters. So, but there is a uh, macro structure that clustered the, the groups. And this macro structure is what we call as the intro times, which are this, this cluster. And uh, we also asked if there were some associations with uh, the, the microbiota and some features, and we identified some associations with age and also to BMI. So this was one of the first descriptions of the, the human gut microbiome that we had. And after that point, we started to search for something more, more, uh, more related to some phenotypes. So uh, there were some studies uh, trying to identify uh, the reason for obesity and also for type two diabetes. And uh, at some point, we were able to, to uh, create clusters and to describe the pathways that could be associated to this kind of thing. So this this is uh, a pathway that is related uh, related to type two diabetes. And if you see here, Achaemenia mucinifera is one of the the key factors. So we are going to talk about that later. So at that moment, like ten ten years ago, uh, we had long reads. We had Sanger reads. So that means that the reads were much longer when compared to, to those that we, we have now. And also uh, the methods for assembly were different. So at that moment, we assembled this, this gene catalog, uh, not the gene catalog because the gene catalog was Illumina, but the data for the intro times we assembled using CAPTRI and ARACNI. So these reads use uh, one approach that's called overlap layout consensus. What happens there? So they have overlap between the reads. We, you see some overlap here. And after they do all this overlap, they connect the reads and create a contig that is a consensus of those overlapping regions. But what happens if we have one single nucleotide that is different from the others here? So the consensus will be the most represented nucleotide. So that means that for 
an environment with multiple microorganisms, you're going to lose the information of the the orange bacteria. So let's suppose that we, we have one environment here with blue and orange bacteria. So when you assembly, because the the orange bacteria is less abundant, the information will disappear in the consensus. So probably we missed a lot of information there. So uh, the same approach, but uh, use it for, for Illumina and short reads. Uh, it's similar because they will generate a consensus, but based on a De Bruyne graph. So the tools that were used for the gene catalog was the soap, the novel uh, assembler. So use short reads and high throughput, and uh, so then you expect a coverage. So the 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 cameras that are underrepresented compared to to that coverage, they will somehow disappear in our final sequence. So that means that if you if you try to assemble this this uh, contig, you are going through this way and reach this final sequence. So this way would be considered as kind of sequence errors because they will be uh, underrepresented when compared to the coverage expected by each camera. So that was a limitation that we had 10 years ago. And uh, then we came to the post genomic error when the, the, the high throughput sequences came out and they start to produce a lot of sequence. So we see here, uh, these are the number of papers that were published every year uh, with the name gut microbiota and the, with green are those that mention that they sequenced the gut microbiota. So we see that we increased the amount of uh, sequencing projects. And this is also because of the, the technology that you have now and we increase the, the number of reads that were produced. And uh, in this post-genomic era, so we have a lot of data uh, that is already published and it's much easier now to sequence than it was before. It's much cheaper than, than it was before. So the methods also change. And there are many tools coming out. So these are the number of publications that were published in bioinformatic journals uh, with the keywords metagenomics of microbiome. They are, they are all tools. So that means that in 2018, it was produced something close to 70 uh, tools for microbiome and metagenomics study. So there are many tools and we need to understand what are the outputs and the limitations of each tool and apply it to answer some biological questions. And some approaches that we can use to study the microbiome is one of the, the, the most used approaches is to sequence some market genes. So this is very important for taxonomic classification. So uh, you need some uh, conserved regions to design the primers to make sure that the primers will cover and will amplify most of the microorganisms that are there in, in your environment. You, you also need some variable region which will, will contain the nucleotide difference that will be used to distinguish between one bacteria A and another bacteria B. And some of the examples of microgenes are the 16S rRNA that is the most used for, for bacteria and archaea, especially in the microbiome study, and also ITS and MLSP, depending on the question of, of who work. So this kind of approach, they answer some kind of question, which is to quantify the, the sequence that you have there. So you can also assess the taxonomic uh, structure and also the, the diversity of the environment. Uh, some people use this kind of information also to predict the functional uh, content of the environment, but the kind of uh, predictive approach is not like very precise. So here is one example of the, the 16S gene. You have nine, uh, nine variable regions, and here are some primates. So when you do the sequence using, for example, one of the most used primates is the 515F and 926R. So that means that you're going to amplify this region that covers the B4 and B5 variable region. So the, 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 the nucleotide variation that will be used to distinguish probably they are in this region. 
So uh, some people always ask which market they need to use. And uh, it depends uh, because if you change your marker uh, region, if you use V2 instead of V3 or V4, you're going to find different results. Here we can see some studies that they did this kind of analysis. And here is one example that when they use the V3 and V4 regions, the results are completely different than when they use other regions. So why this happens? Uh, maybe there are many there are many possibilities here, but what one possibility is that this pair of primaries are not uh, amplifying the bacteria. Which one is this? Bacteroides? And probably you have less bacteroids here than others. Or maybe they are amplifying more the other bacteria and then you are struggling the, the bacteroids here. So there are many, uh, many causes to, to see this, this difference. So that's why it's extremely important to make sure uh, that when you are doing, when you are doing some comparative studies, you use the same marker, the same primer, and also the same uh, uh, PCR parameters to make sure that your your results are, uh, can be compared. So uh, there are some ways to identify the the markers that uh, fits better to to your study. But first of all, you need to know your your candidate. If you don't know your candidate, then you are going to to explore the environment without no no uh, certain of something there that your bacteria is there. But you know your candidates, you can search for the for the uh, view region that can be used to distinguish between your candidates and other bacteria. So here it's one study, for example, that we, we had to identify uh, the, the mycobacteria lepre in the environment. So we needed to identify one region that could be used to distinguish between mycobacterial lepre and other microbacteria. So we wanted to identify the species, not only the genus. So we did this, this kind of analysis. So we identified the V6 region or V1 and V2 could be used to distinguish uh, the, micro, the microbacterial lepre from other microbacteria. But also when you choose uh, one pair of primer, you have some impact in, in the in the the microbial community that you're going to identify because the pair of primary maybe does not amplify some some family or taxonomic group that could be interesting for you. So that's why it's very uh, useful to know and under, and understand about your environment. So then you can design the the most appropriate primary for that. And uh, uh, there are many ways to to study and uh, to assess the, this information, the, the uh, genetic markers. One one way that was used the long for for a long time, like for the past 15 years, it would be widely used. It is the OTU, which is the uh, uh, it's a taxonomical unit. It's not a genus. It's not a species. It's not a family. It's a taxonomic unit. So that means that you use it uh, to describe the community structure, but you don't have any specificity because at some point you group some bacteria that uh, fit into a, a arbitrary threshold. Usually they consider it as 97% as this threshold, but I don't know why they started with this 97%. And uh, another approach is that, that was uh, recently introduced it's the ASV, which is the amplicon sequence variant. So uh, you will work with unique sequences. And uh, you can use this to identify sequence biomarkers. And this is good because you can uh, easily reproduce this because you know the complete sequence of your biomarker. The problem is that this can be overestimated. So for diversity studies, maybe your diversity will be overestimated, not because uh, some you have a lot of microorganisms there, but the method is identifying some some sequence variant as some new organism. So, and the other problem is that this may be computer intensive because uh, it's based on my, on machine learning, and probably you're going to load your your RAM memory in your computer. Uh, but 
always very important to choose wisely your tool and know the parameters and how to set them. Because, for example, uh, so let's suppose that we have these sequences. These are all amplicons that were sequenced. And at some point, we are going to cluster them in OTUs. So then here, we are going to have two OTUs. One is grouping all the sequences that are green, blue, and the light blue. And the OTU2 is the red, orange, and, and yellow. So this is the nightmare for the colorblind people, <laughs> but don't mind. So, uh, so we have two OTUs here. And uh, we, uh, the, the method will choose one of these sequences to represent the whole group. So that means that if you choose uh, just the blue sequence or the red sequence to, to represent the whole group, the light blue and the group sequence will not be represented here. So if your candidate belongs to the green sequence, you wouldn't be able to reproduce this same result in other studies. And also, you're going to assign one taxonomy for like three or four different sequences based on only one representative sequence. And then you can assign, for example, like a whale to, to your OTU that are similar to fishes. And we know that whales are not fishes. So to solve this, this kind of problem, now we are using more machine learning methods uh, also to, to identify, oh sorry, also to, to identify the, uh, the sequences and also to assign taxonomy to them. So this is one of our group uh, products. So we have one taxonomic uh, classifier that is based on amplicons and also to machine learning. So we avoid this uh, arbitrary threshold of 97% of identity, for example. And another approach to study this is uh, the, the shotgun approach. So that means they are going to sequence every DNA that's there in the environment. So uh, you're going to break your DNA and you're going to sequence everything there. The problem and the limitation is that because you don't know the coverage. So you don't know if you are sequencing enough to see everything that you want to see. So it's a kind of blind shot. So uh, if you don't know the environment, you are going to make a lot of pilot studies before identify uh, the, the, the result that you want to, to see. So at a long time ago, we used this kind of methods as well to, to, uh, to do the, the functional classification and also the taxonomic classification of, shot, of shotgun sequence. So this was a paper that was published, I think it was in 2010. It was the approach that we used for the for the intro type paper. And uh, we had two different ways, one that went for functional annotation and the other one to taxonomic classification. So there are two different approaches that must be considered as different things. If you try to merge the functional classification with the taxonomic classification, maybe you can have a problem. Uh, one of the problems is because uh, if you link your taxonomic classification to the functional, you're going to miss the intergenic region. And the other problem is that if you try to assign taxonomy based on a protein uh, database, for example, then you're going to lose the resolution that is given by the nucleotide sequence. Because we have three nucleotides that are one codon, and one codon will be one amino acid. And one amino acid, you can have up to six different codons. So you're going to lose the, the, the resolution if you search in the in a protein database such like uh, NGRS. So now we are doing something different. So we changed the way that we look at the the, the big data. And uh, now the assembly method, they consider all the variants. We remember that when we were using uh, SOAP de novo or Velvet, they searched for the scammer uh, path that you uh, fits to the same coverage and makes one consensus uh, sequence, now they will identify every possible variant here. So you're going to identify the most abundant and also the, the less abundant uh, Also the, the gene calling method, they change it because now we don't have uh, just one model to, to predict. So let's suppose that we want to identify some some uh, bacterial genes using a Markov model, for example, like in, in GenoMark. 
So you can use one bacteria as model to identify the codon usage. Uh, but when you're looking for a complex environment, you don't have one codon usage uh, pattern. So you need to consider everything. So the limitation of this approach that we have now is that maybe we can have an overestimation of contig engine because maybe this contig is not real, maybe it's just sequencing errors that will be described that some um, low abundant bacteria. And also some genes can be predicted, but they are just ORFs, like random ORFs and not a real gene. So uh, that's why it's very important to know, uh, understand your method and uh, know what is your question. So you need to know if your data fits to, to your biological question. So sometimes we see a lot of this kind of thing, especially when we're working with bioinformatics, some people go and ask for some plots and uh, you know that the data does not support that kind of analysis. And then they ask you to do some magic, but that's not what a bioinformatician does. The, bioinform the bioinformatician needs to connect the data to the biological question and to translate this to, to the computer. So that's why it's very important to be connected to the data producer. And there are many ways to, to many approaches to uh, explore your data. It, it also depends on your questions. And uh, then we start to search for markers. After all this descriptive uh, period, now we are searching for markers so we can identify markers for uh, colorectal cancer or also cardiovascular risk. There are many things that we can explore. And uh, one of the examples that we can use for uh, identify markers, here is one, one data that I, I have here. I have 150 patients and I want to associate the, the type of delivery if it was a C-section or, or a vaginal birth. And I stratified my sequence by BMI of 25. That is a kind of threshold, arbitrary threshold, threshold for obesity. So there is no bias in my sequence, and then I search it, and I identified here some bacteria, like this uh, Comamona that is overrepresented at some point in the in the C-section delivery. So then, oh, I want to disappear this also. Uh, so at some point, uh, I search for the literature to find something that to correlate this this bacteria, this common monads with obesity, and I will find a paper in cell uh, journal that correlating that. And then I search for the same thing, but uh, with the with the high BMI group. So then I identified here one pattern with, especially with the vaginal birth bacteria, they are overrepresented with this bacteria Mitsoquella. So then I search in the lab, in the PubMed, and then I find a paper that is correlating uh, the this bacteria, Mitsoquella, and with obesity. It's related to the 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 way that they they uh, use energy. So we can find some association. We will always find some association. This is something that in science we call as heart heart effect that is hypothesizing after resultanum. So you know the result and you try to find a way to explain those results. And this is happening a lot now. So if you look, many of the microbiome studies, uh, uh, if they are published in science, nature, PNS, they are not reproducible. So you need to read your papers carefully and understand if the biological question that uh, is covered by, by the paper uh, is the same that you want to, to identify. So they are not reproducible, but by a lot of uh, cause. So uh, they can be related to clustering methods like they use OTU, so you cannot reproduce the same result. And also the classification method or the assembly method. So they can identify different things there. And uh, 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 this is one example. So you can see here, uh, this is a report for a very famous uh, company that they do the the, the microbiome sequences. And uh, you see here that uh, for the pre-diabetic risk, we have the Aphemanta which is 
inversely associated. So that means that as more arteries you have, uh, lower is your pre-diabetic risk. And also for diabetes, uh, for type two diabetes, the same bacteria is highly associated. And if you see, they have different uh, reference for, for that. So I checked the, those reference and the biological question is completely different. So you cannot just say that Akemansa Mutumifu is causing or is related to uh, everything that's related to pre-diabetes pre or type 2 diabetes. You need to read the paper and, and interpret the results there. So when you take just the final phrase of the abstract and take that as the main conclusion of the paper, probably you are going to, to do this kind of thing. You are going to misassociate uh, results and put in, in your report, for example. So uh, this is a problem that we see a lot now, especially when we have a lot of correlation. We have many metadata and also a lot of data that we want to correlate to identify which bacteria is growing with uh, the glucose metabolism or with the, some, some other parameters that we want to identify like obesity markers and uh, cardiovascular risk markers. So you have a lot of metadata and a lot of data and you try to correlate. You will find some correlation. And uh, usually people try to uh, sell this correlation as causation. And uh, this is a big problem, especially for those that uh, take this, in, this sentence uh, literally and uh, start to, to spread this uh, spurious correlation. So this is, a, is the biggest trap when we are working with uh, big data, which is the spurious correlation. We are going to see that every time, everywhere. That's why it's important to have multiple tests and correction, and also to uh, be skeptical uh, related to, to your, your results. Otherwise, we can finish doing things like this. Like uh, you can identify some correlation here, it's the cheese consumption. It's highly correlated to the number of people that die uh, becoming tangled by their bad cheese. And, or the, the divorce rate in Maine and uh, the per capita consumption of margarin. So we see that there is some correlation, but people take this and uh, start to make some breaking news with this. So they are kind of misinterpreted of the of the correlations and also uh, the way that this kind of information is exposed to uh, to the readers especially for those uh, general public not only in the the scientific field because they will buy this this conclusion this easy and impactant conclusion so uh, another way that we can use to identify biomarkers is uh, through metatranscriptomics. So uh, there are the transcripts that are being uh, expressed in, in that environment. There are many ways for us to approach that. We can assemble or we can just map to a reference genomes. And nowadays we have a lot of reference genomes for microbes uh, from the human gut. Uh, thanks to the uh, human, human microbiome project, they sequence a lot of these references. And uh, this is kind of tricky especially when we are working with humans, because we cannot control the human behavior. So we have some people there and they are different. They are genetically different. They have different ages and they, they some were exposed to some drug and some were, uh, were using a placebo group. So we want to compare and these, these are the number of reads that were mapped to the gene A, B, C, or D. So we use this number of reads to, to uh, to estimate the, the gene expression, and then we are going to find the, the differentially expressed gene. So, but this can be changed by the human habits and also uh, genetic background, and also especially now in this in this case that we are talking about microbiota, which is the microbiota composition. So let's suppose that each uh, individual they have different behaviors like. The, break, uh, the breakfast that they have and also the habits that they have. Some will smoke, some will do some exercise. So this will have some impact in, in, in the, the microbiota and not only 
the drug or the placebo that they are using. And uh, concerning the, the microbiota co composition, so let's suppose that we have this, this bacteria and you have this amount of weeds uh, for the group that uses the drug and this amount of, of uh, transcript for the placebo group. So we would think that this gene is uh, overexpressed in the placebo group while it's underexpressed in the drug group, right? But uh, there is something in the background, which is the metagenomic uh, content. So uh, maybe this gene, uh, you have more transcripted related to that because you have more bacteria, more of this bacteria and more of this gene in that environment. So one thing is linked, directly linked to the other. And usually we don't see this kind of comparison in metatranscriptomic papers. They just take the amount of reads and they do the differentially uh, expressed genes. So this is something that much should be considered and uh, used as a way to normalize this information. And then we start to integrate the data. So we also have the metabolomes that we can integrate. And uh, we must understand why we are doing this kind of integration that life is not linear. We have many, many factors that can uh, change the phenotype and also the way that we interact with the world. So we have the host factors, we have habits, we have the environment, uh, the transcription, the post-regulation, and uh, we have many things that can be related. And as more skeptical as we are, the better will be our model. Because simple models, usually they are not right, because life's not as simple. So for example, this is one work that we identified some markers to, uh, to build one simple model. It's not that complex. And uh, uh, first of all, we started that from a background that the, infl the inflammation can be a key marker for type 2 diabetes. So here we have the inflammation and we have the, the glucose level. But then there are, there are papers that mention that the bacteria is also important for the glucose level. So how can we connect the inflammation and the bacteria? So this is what we were doing. So uh, we designed some, some experiments with mice to test the, the impact of the inflammation through the uh, interferon gamma and also the bacterial part, which was the Achaemansia multinifla that helped with, the, with the, the glucose level. So we identified the markers using correlations and this kind of thing. And then we, uh, we knocked out the, the, the interferon and we added Achaemansia, uh, all the combinations to identify uh, the, the, the role of Achaemansia and the interferon gamma this uh, blood glucose level. So the outcome, the final outcome of this model is the, the blood glucose level. So we identified the, the glucose level, it's uh, related to the amount of Achaemansia that you have and the amount of interferon gamma that you have and, uh, and some, uh, some transcripts that can be produced in some proteins there in the environment as well. But these are two key factors the inflammation and the bacteria. But also, if you don't have this bacteria, it doesn't mean that you're not going, that you're going to develop some type two diabetes. It's much more complex than that. So it's not linear. There are many variables here, like the intro type, because there are some, some intro type that you don't have a chemistry, and uh, this is not bad for you. And uh, then we try to identify some biomarks that can be reproduced. So there are many ways to be uh, very uh, restrict with your biomarkers. One thing that I usually do is uh, that I test to identify the differentially abundant bacteria. Then I do like thousand bootstraps. And uh, then I choose like six uh, random samples every time and then I do pairwise experiments. Like here I select the random samples and then I compare to others. So those, those markers that are reproduced in almost every experiment like this one in 999 uh, times that I did the same experiment, th this bacteria was identified as a biomarker and it's Achaemansia. So this is one way that we use to see how robust uh, your marker is and how, 
how wide this can be used. And then we use these markers, or these markers to design models. So the predictive models usually, usually are going to need a sensitivity and a specificity. And these are important features to know uh, how strong and uh, how can you use this, this kind of uh, information. And uh, another model that we are developing is the model for cardiovascular risk. So we know that uh, uh, your, your food habits and your the way that you do your exercise in your microbiota can, can have some influence in, in your heart disease. Uh, but there are many other things like your, your heart can also, your healthy state can also change your microbiota. And also the food that you eat can change your, your microbiota. And also your exercise can change. So it's a complex network that we try to solve this. But considering that you have two parameters here that you can change and your microbiota you cannot change, if you fix this, then you can kind of modulate the exercises uh, and also your nutrition to decrease your cardiovascular risk. And then for this, we have a lot of uh, nutrients and uh, a lot of individuals, and we're exploring all the correlations to try to, to design. So here is something that I noted here that we are not using OTUs, but we are using unique sequence like those ASDs that I mentioned. This is important because we can ensure the reproducibility because everyone will work with the same sequence. So uh, after exploring all, all this metadata, so I tried to build some, some uh, model. So the model is an equation that will describe your outcome. So one of the outcomes that I, ch I checked here is the, is the high castell index. This high castell index is something that uh, reflects the, the inversion in, in the lipid transportation. So we identified some markers, some, some, some bacteria markers, and also the intro time, the intro type, the choline ingestion, the number uh, of the amount of exercise that you do per week, and also your testosterone level, and F, all of this will be converted in one equation that will give you the, the risk of having a high castell index. That means that your cholesterol transport is inverted. So you are hiding the good cholesterol and you are exposing the, the bad cholesterol. So when I did this model, we identified 70.6% of the, the cases could be explained by this model. So we still miss 42.4% uh, of the cases. So because there are many other parameters here that should be these here in this model, but they are not. For example, the the host uh, genetic information. So there is a very strong uh, uh, influence here. So that's why we cannot uh, identify everything yet, but we are trying to add more more uh, features to the model and be the, the, the most sensitive as possible. Uh, we can also use this for, for diagnosis for let's suppose that we identify one bacteria and the one single sequence and we can design a probe, for example, that you link to the, to the bacteria DNA there in the environment and then you're going to uh, like shine something there in your environment and then we're going to identify that your environment contains that bacteria and that can be used as diagnosis or something. For example, for the cardiovascular risk, you can use these two samples, extract the DNA, and then we're going to identify that you have one bacteria that can be re related to the cardiovascular risk. And then you can, for example, use uh, like a smart to toilet. When the stool sample reach the water, then there is something there, like a probe that will link to the DNA, and then we change the color of the wa water. So that means that you need to avoid the, the calling the choline ingestion. So you can change your your nutrition, your the food that you eat based on the color of your toilet. That would be nice. And this could be also used for color color rectal cancer. It's the same thing it's like a smart toilet. So uh, all of these kind of of uh, approaches they are they are happening now. There are companies that are doing this this kind of smart toilet. And also, this will also change the personalized nutrition because you're going to, uh, at some point, you're going to your 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 
doctor or your nutritionist with a USB drive and then you're going to deliver and the, then they will choose what you can eat and what you can't based on all of, on this uh, machine learning. There are two recent papers that they use these models. You see the, here is one, one model that can, break, uh, that can predict your performance in marathons based on your uh, microbial content in your gut because there are some bacteria that can uh, degrade the excess of lactate. So that means that you can run for a longer time. And uh, also, this also leads to the fecal microbiota transplantation that can be, that is now being used for C. diff infection or, or some cases of obesity and some syndromes as well. I think that now they stopped it for a while because there were some problems, but they, they, they are using this a lot for for validation in mice, of course, in the lab, uh, to to validate your markers that could be related. So the biggest change challenge for bioinformatics now is to integrate all this kind of data. So we need to to produce the data that answer the the question. So uh, we need to be very precise in the data collection and also in the data analysis. So this will follow if you do this kind of thing right. So then we need to combine all the knowledge that we have and we produce it over this, this 10 years and then we can design models that are very complex. And uh, after that, we need to validate the market. So this is the future. So one year ago, uh, the the AMBO organization, they, they were, uh, they opened one call to for biologists to describe the cells or organisms as an algorithm. So here is the question, are we an algorithm? So is, is that linear? So if we have this kind of information there inside the cells, so then the, the phenotype will be this. So it, it's the, the human body predictable like, like that. So this is something that must be considered for the future. And the, 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 the message is to think outside the box and also inside the box because you need to understand your data and how it was produced. Sometimes we just extract the DNA and send to China so they will do some magic there, they will sequence, and they will give you back one USB drive. And then you go to put that in the in the supercomputer and the supercomputer will do everything for you. But you need to understand how your data was generated and how you're going to assess this information what is your biological question and how you're going to interpret your data. So that's why it's very important to think inside the data that you produce it and to think outside the box and know uh, how to interpret and how to expand all those knowledge. And uh, this is your take home message, to think about what you're doing and be skeptical about what, what you're seeing because uh, the models must be precise at some point. So that's all. Thank So are there questions here? Hello, can you hear me, Gabriel? Yes. Hi, Gabriel. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, any questions from the attendees? If you have any question, please use the chat box to, to send a message to Gabriel. Questions? It was everything so clear that I don't have questions. Or it was everything yeah. so complex. <laughs> 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 you never know. Uh, let's 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 wait. So okay, I, I have a question uh, for you, Gabriel. Yeah. Um, are you trying to to relate this microbiome data with genetics background from the population? Yeah, there are there are some works that tried to to identify some. It was a kind of juos approach you know but it's yeah exactly yeah uh 
but the problem is that there are so many markets that could be related and the relationship is not that strong. So that means that uh, if you have that information, this, info this genetic information is associated to some bacteria, but doesn't mean that you're going to have all of this, that bacteria because the microbial environment is highly complex and there is a lot of competition there. So even if you have one, one gene uh, that will be related to the highest production of one product that could be used by your bacteria as the substrate for your bacteria to grow. There are many other bacteria that there in the environment that that are doing something for that bacteria do not grow too much. You know? So it's very complex to link the the presence or absence of one bacteria to the to the host genome. There are some associations, but they are not that linear, you know? Okay, okay, got it. I think that is maybe more than the genetic background is more related with the lifestyle of the population, maybe. Yeah, I, I think that there is no, no measure to see which, uh, which feature is the most uh, relevant or the most important for to, to shape your your microbiota but uh, we know that uh, your microbiota works like uh, an stable state that can shift so you have the biggest drivers that will shape everything that is under there uh, under the, the kind of umbrella and uh, okay and based on that uh, you cannot change that much so if you take one antibiotic, for example, you're going to kill a lot of bacteria, but at some point you're going to restore your, your, your microbiome to the same structures that you had before, because the biggest guys were there. And those big, biggest guys are those that are producing some nutrients and they are produce some antibiotics that will uh, control the growth of the other bacteria. No, it's, okay. it's, it's very complex. Got it. Yeah, I think that we are in an initial, we, we are giving the initial steps in order to make some functional, the data mm -hmm. that we are producing from metagenomics, right? We mm -hmm. are, uh, do you think that we are in, we are in the initial stage or we are in the, in the middle of these uh, stages? Yeah, we are in the middle, but uh, we need to change uh to to the future already to try okay. to do something more more translational because we, we produce a Got lot it. of data already and uh now yeah. people are, are, are just redoing things like uh, exploring things that were explored already and they see that uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to reproduce because they use different markers and they use different approaches so i think that at some point we need to to standardize the way that we are approaching this kind of thing to make something that can be reproducible and also use it for for therapies and this kind of thing. Okay, got it. Yeah, it's, it's as you say, we need to think out of the of the box. Yeah, we need to think something <laughs> different because we are yeah. we are doing the same thing for ten years. Got it. So Gabriel, we have a question from uh, Mauricio. Uh, and I'm also going from to... Angela. Angela. Yeah, also please. Asked. Yeah, please, please go ahead, uh, Gabriel. Angela, I ask it, uh, have you been working uh, in something related to gut brain access? So now, now we are in a project uh, with the gut brain access, but uh, related to the liver function. So w when you, w when you, uh, when you cut the, the vagus nerve, so you change the, 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 the liver function. And uh, the liver uh, is, the, is the main door when, you, when some nutrients or some bacteria uh, leave the, the, the gut. And also uh, there is a direct connection between the gut and the brain. And uh, if you cut this connection, maybe you can change something. This is a project that we are starting now. We are designing the, the experiment and now we are going to, to start to validate this in animal models. But uh, as soon as I have the results, I will, sh I will share with you. But I think that uh, 
maybe this this kind of of uh, cut in the in the connection between gut and brain will we, we'll change something, especially in the liver. We see that the function changes already. Yeah, but 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 Gabriel, uh, is that relation gut brain mediated mainly by metabolites, right? We, I I don't know actually. I don't know if it is based on on, on metabolites or or it's related to some uh, signaling pathways that the enterocytes can 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 identify and send this signal to the brain. Signals. Okay. I actually don't know. Okay, next 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 one. The next question is from Mauricio and uh, do you know about the possible bias in diverse analysis of microbiomes caused by the primers of the ITS region? Yeah. The ITS region is a problem because you can you uh they have a a very wide range, especially related to the length of the sequence. So that means that sometimes you cannot sequence the, the, the full ITS region. So I think that it can range from 160 bases up to 700. So that means that everything in the between can be identified and sometimes you are not going to sequence. And uh, so those information that you cannot sequence, you are missing. So this will change the diversity. So it's very dangerous to uh, make uh, inferences uh, related to the diversity when you when you use uh, uh, biomarkers that cannot be uh, easily accessed, or you have some standard for at least for the the methods that are going to assemble your your paired reads. So sometimes you're going to underestimate your your diversity because you're missing some guys, or sometimes you're going to overestimate because you, uh, each uh, each length variant can be considered as a different organism, but they are not actually a different organism. They are the same thing, but with uh, different ITS variations. It's dangerous. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, any questions? Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. I think that, that that's You're all welcome. we are on time. It's time for, for, yeah, for lunch for us. <laughs> yeah, it's and for, thank you. For for <laughs> and thank you again for this insightful uh, talk, uh, Gabriel. And we hope to have you in an S session when you have more results to show us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can call. So, me. okay, thank you, Gabriel. Obrigado. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye -bye. Ciao.